This is Echo Zoe Radio, episode 192, for August 2024, with Ryan Habana on The Seed Promise. Welcome to Echo Zoe Radio, the podcast outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries, where you'll hear about important topics affecting the church today. Our primary goal is to explore a variety of issues while remaining faithful to God and His Word. Stay with us for the next hour as your host, Andy Olson, shares his conversation with this month's guest. Here's your host, Andy Olson. I'm Andy Olson. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. This is episode 192 for August 2024. After a three-month hiatus, I'm back with another episode. Ryan Habana is also back as this month's guest, bringing with him the topic, which is the seed promise. In an attempt to get this episode posted at the beginning of August, show notes are minimal, and this episode is audio only. You'll find the episode page at echozoe.com slash 192. Finally, I want to remind everyone about the Christian podcast community. As a member of the Christian podcast community, I can't recommend it highly enough. There are dozens of fantastic podcasts available to the Christian podcast community, focusing on a wide variety of subjects and all in a biblical manner. While the podcasters in the Christian podcast community don't agree on everything, all of them seek to glorify God through their shows. Check them out at christianpodcastcommunity.org. And with that, here's my discussion with Ryan. Ryan, uh, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, you've been gone for a couple months, right? The last episode I did was April, which okay. I posted at the end of April. So. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say welcome back. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So no May episode, no June episode, no July episode. We're recording July 28th, but we'll post this in August. So, yeah. yeah. It's good to have the 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 yearly episode <laughs> on, the, uh, on the calendar here. Yeah. So, and I, I, uh, I've actually already recorded our introduction and conclusion stuff. So stick around if you're interested on some of that, uh, the last two minutes of audio for this file. So I'll talk a little bit about the absence of, uh, and not having episodes for three months and kind of where that is and what's, what's, what's been and what's coming and stuff a little bit, not much to say, but if you're curious, the last two minutes. Cool. So the, uh, topic you brought with us is the seed promise. Yeah, there. Uh, you know, you usually leave it in my lap to <laughs> come up with. A, 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 you always it, come up with something better than I could give you. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but sometimes we, you know, when we've talked, we've talked about some some things that are uh, a little more laser focused. This is something that is is very broad in scope that we're going to talk about, but it's something that even within the next you know hour or so, however long we want to talk about this. Uh, we really can get into some elements of the scriptures that, if you're not aware of them, they really do help you advance in your knowledge of the whole counsel of God. Mm-hmm. And this seed promise, uh, if if you're unfamiliar with it, you might be unfamiliar with it uh, in its uh, explicit declaration, but the... Uh, the essence of the seed promise, if you're a believer in the Bible, if you're a believer in the gospel, uh, in, in some way you know it already. You just maybe aren't categorizing it correctly uh, or uh, are just, uh, I say this in a nice way, are just ignorant of uh, of the, uh, the expansive nature of this theology that we find that begins in, in Genesis and goes all the way through the book of revelation and and i'm it will probably get into how that specifically comes about where we see that in both the early chapters of genesis as well as the book of revelation the the word seed the seed promise is uh is there the word uh we'll, we'll talk about the the essence of the word itself uh, but the the other thing is is uh, not only is there a promise with the seed it's a, it's a, it's actually a war 
and uh, this war is the war of, of of all human history, and we'll find that in the uh, in the origin of this uh, this el- this seed promise, seed war, the seed, seed declaration in Genesis three fifteen. Now, when you bring topics, a lot of times um, it seems to come out of your you know you teach the this through the Bible class, and a lot of times it seems to come out of that because you you'll bring in these topics that relate to themes that are woven through throughout the scripture beginning to end is that really where this yeah comes from? It, it, it really is something that i do uh, quite a bit uh mm-hmm. i teach cover to cover each year and oftentimes i, I have several classes where i'm doing that uh, each year genesis to revelation cover to cover in the bible and in order to do that uh in a way that that people are going to grasp, you really do need to have these thematic things that people are looking for and looking at. And uh, the seed promise is one of those pillars uh, that as we go from Genesis through Revelation, uh, we'll constantly be noting that this is a seed promise here. We'll be looking in uh, Genesis or Exodus or uh, Ruth, for instance, uh, or the beginning of Matthew, you know, this is the seed promise. Uh, and then um, conflicts, you know, this is the seed war, the war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And although it might not be explicitly declared as that in certain texts, the concept is there. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're right that, um, you know, I think... It was either last time or a couple years ago we talked about the transfiguration. So mm-hmm. even even that we have um, a, a singular episode that is chronicled in the Synoptic Gospels, but that has big ramifications for the whole Council of God with the Law and the Prophets and the Messiah, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant elements that are therein. So I, it is kind of a, a hallmark of. I, Number one, I think it's good because I know we're going to have enough to talk about, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, this uh, we'll, this will be a truncated version of of looking at the seed promise. We'll see where, like I, I told you pre-show, we'll see where the conversation takes us yeah. uh, because there's so many different places we can go. Yeah. Well, that's, like I said, that's why I, generally when I ask you to come on, I don't have a topic because you always have something that's, like I said, it's more interesting than I can bring and ask you to talk about well and if you and, again if next year we're still doing this you can always if the lord so wills you can always throw a top in my way too. <laughs> yeah well and um i still haven't had a chance to do your your through the bible course mm-hmm. that you do and but everybody i've ever talked to who's done it just raves about it how awesome it is and uh, i think the reason people really are impacted by it is seeing the cohesive nature of the bible mm-hmm uh, it isn't, these aren't 66 loose books that are just uh, disconnected to one another. This, these are 66 books that are uh, united by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and there are particular themes that uh, are, are flowing through each of the books. And like I said, the seed promise or the this, this seed concept is one that not only starts in Genesis 3.15, but it advances in different ways. Uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about Abraham this, uh, this episode and how important it is to understand the promise that God gives to Abraham regarding his seed, his offspring. And the scriptures tell us that if we're going to be saved, we have to be Abraham's offspring. And... In what sense are we Abraham's offspring? And Paul answers that in Galatians chapter three, but that's the sea promise. Uh, it's 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 uh, a concept that is found early in. And again, this isn't anything novel. This isn't anything that um, you know I've in any way originated. This is something that is is found in in modern theology. It's found in ancient theology. It's. Um, uh, it's it's found in um, you know in even rabbinical uh, you know intertestamental uh, works. Uh, so it, it it is something that uh, is 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 ancient in its not only its origins but ancient in its commentaries. 
And uh, as far as our understanding of the seed promise, the New Covenant writings are primary because that helps us understand the fulfillment. What we find in the Old Testament, for the most part, is the uh, is the promise and the advancement of the promise of the seed. Uh, it's ultimately with the coming of Christ that uh, the seed promise finds its fulfillment. And then there is a one and many dynamic that we'll talk about, that mm-hmm. uh, there is one seed, that's what Paul says, but there's also many uh, within this seed promise that are going to experience the crushing of the serpent's head or inheriting the uh, the promises given to Abraham and their, their forth. And one of the other things we'll, we'll talk about a, a, a bit found in Genesis 3.15 is the seed war. Uh, this There is a, a, a conflict that uh, is announced in Genesis 3.15 between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And uh, I, I think that's the seed or the, uh, the conflict that is at the backdrop of kind of all human history. Mm-hmm. Something that we see can see throughout history. The seed of the serpent is against the seed of the woman, God's chosen line, God's chosen people and person. And uh, it's something that we see throughout history and we see today. We see it rearing its head today as well. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, I assume you're starting in Genesis 3. You've already said 3.15. Yeah, so why uh, why don't we just start there? Um, Again, to contextualize this. uh, You want me to read it? Sure, go go for it. So Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head, his heel. His heel. Yeah, so the, the context here is, of course, the, the fall of humanity. So the serpent has come, and we know the serpent, whatever else we want to say about the serpent, there's all sorts of interesting things we can consider, but the serpent is Satan. That's something that we find in the commentary of the, the New Testament, and uh, not only history, but New, New Testament specifically says the serpent of old is Satan. And so this is the enemy, the great enemy of the people of God, the great enemy of of humanity. And so he tempts uh, Adam and Eve, and they fall. And here what we are finding here is the Lord giving uh, announcements to the serpent, to the woman, and to the uh, man, to Adam. And so this, what we find here in in chapter 3, is directed to the serpent when he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So there is conflict. The Lord is establishing enmity as conflict. So you have conflict between you and the woman. So Eve uh, is the the originator here, the one that is going to produce or is going to come forth from Eve is the fulfillment of the promise. Now, we see the conflict then extends between your offspring and her offspring. So Eve is going to have offspring that comes forth from her, and the serpent also has offspring. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky question, is who, who is the serpent's offspring? Mm-hmm. And there are a few different ways we could go with that. Uh, there are... Um, people that look at some of the early things that happened in Genesis in regards to uh, Genesis chapter 6 and the sons of God going into the daughters of men. Uh, some people really uh, look at that as, as perhaps the primary. I don't, I don't think that's the primary uh, application here. I think if we were to understand what the primary application here is, is, uh, is found in John chapter 8. Uh, In John chapter 8, Jesus is in a debate. We'll just summarize this. We're going to have to do a lot of summarizing today (laughs) because there's a lot of of, um, places to cover. But in John chapter 8, there is a a debate about who's Abraham's seed. And the uh, the, um, people of Jesus' day, these some, some, and these were, Jews that were initially following Jesus, and Jesus then challenges them in a way, saying, uh, you know, if you uh, the, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And this offended them because it was a declaration that they were slaves, slaves to sin. Uh, and 
the uh, this started off then a, a big heated debate between Jesus and some of uh, the Jews of the day. And um, Jesus really turns the table on them when they're, he says, I know you're Abraham's offspring, but you seek to kill me. And he says, you are of your father, the devil, who, again, is opposed to the seed promise. Uh, and ultimately, as, as we advance here, we'll see that those that are opposed to God and his purposes and God and his Messiah, these are the sons of the devil or uh, of the seed of the serpent. So I don't think this is necessarily speaking of a natural progeny. I think it's speaking of a, uh, uh, a figurative offspring. The son of Satan isn't saying that they are actually spawns mm -hmm. of Satan, but rather they embody the opposition that Satan has against God and his, his promise in people. So we have this enmity, we have this war, and the, the word between your offspring and her offspring, now the word here is uh, in Hebrew, Zara. Uh, and Zara is uh, a term that means seed. It does mean seed or offspring. And it's in what's called the collective singular. And this is important. Paul actually speaks on the, the gr grammar of this in Galatians chapter 3, which uh, is... The collective singular is basically, it's a word that, depending on context, can either be speaking of one or speaking of many. Uh, the English equivalent, seed is actually an English, English equivalent, but deer is another one. Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't say there's a bunch of deers. We would say uh, if there's one deer, there's a deer. Or if there's 20 deer, we would say, oh, there's a herd of deer. So uh, it's a depending on context, the word Zara can mean one or many. And both, I think, are embedded here. So uh, the serpent has offspring. He has many offspring that are opposed to God and his purposes. But there's also one that ultimately is going to uh, go forth in ultimate opposition to God and his purposes. And, and I do think the ultimate seed of the serpent is going to be the Antichrist. Uh, in the same way, the woman's offspring, and again, this is God's chosen lineage. Now, this launches a promise that when we see here, we see he shall wound your head and you shall wound his heel. Or, uh, and I, I think wound is probably better rather than bruise. Bruise, we kind of think of just a, you know, a flesh, a spot, wound. A flesh wound. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, a, a wound is likely better. A, 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 a heel wound is uh, one that is, um, that is brought about, it's, it's not fatal, uh, at least it's, it's not decisive, I should say. Uh, it's in the process of uh, crushing the serpent's head, the, uh, the he here, and the he here is in the singular. So the he here, there is a, and it's a masculine singular. So there is a male child. That's, what, that's all the evidence we're given here that is going to crush the serpent's head. Uh, destroy the works of the devil is how John would put it. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is called by many, um, going again back, like I said, this, the commentaries on this go back a long ways. This has been called by many the Proto-Evangelium, or the first gospel. The first time the gospel, it speaks of the wounding, but also the, the conquering of this he that is going to come from Eve. So have you ever wondered why there is so many uh, genealogies in the Bible? Uh, let's be honest, most, most of the time we probably skip over them if we're reading them. Mm -hmm. But especially the book of Genesis, but again, going beyond the book of Genesis, there are other ones. We have genealogies. And the genealogy, especially in the book of Genesis, uh, and then when we get in the New Testament, it's the same thing. It's tracing the seed promise. Uh, there's this war, remember, in Genesis that I'll put enmity between you and the woman between her seed and your, and, and your seed. Uh, I believe Cain and Abel are ultimately a, 
an expression of this seed war. Uh, the serpent counterattacks, and he looks to either corrupt or destroy. Mm -hmm. So he corrupts Cain to murder righteous Abel. And then what we find is, uh, you know, a, a male child of Eve is corrupted. A male child of Eve is destroyed. So they're both, in, in kind of a sense, disqualified because, again, the, the implication here is the one that destroys the, the seed of the woman is going to be righteous. Or, or they're not the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent is going to be righteous. So um, then Seth is born. And then we have this genealogy that makes its way through the early chapters of Genesis, which brings us to, ultimately, to Noah. And what, what I often say in my classes is the most precious thing that was actually preserved on the ark uh, wasn't animal life. We wouldn't even necessarily say it was human life itself. It was the promise that God said one of Eve's offspring is going to crush the serpent's head. And that was preserved with Noah on the ark. If God would have wiped out all humanity, Genesis 3.15, this crushing of the serpent's head, wouldn't be something that would come about. So we have in the early chapters of Genesis this raging seed war going on. Yeah, and I'm thinking as you're saying this that um, the serpent at this point doesn't necessarily have any kind of timetable. He, he doesn't know if this is next week, next right. year, thousands of years from now, whatnot. So he's going to counterattack right away, Cain and Abel. Right. Not thinking, not knowing. And thinking, well, I can thwart this. Right. And even the corruption of humanity, um, you know, there's a, a debate about whether the, the sons of God going into the daughters of men were, was angelic going in to corrupt the, uh, you know, the, the line of humanity because it's a human. Mm -hmm. And I, that's my, the position that I, I think is most compelling. Uh, and I think that is part of the seed war. And uh, God, when it says Noah was perfect in his generations. You know, just, I had about a quarter of my listeners just turn this off. Like, well, you're one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, huh? right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, to, to let them know that's not going to be the, the dominant theme that we have here. But Oh, uh, they don't care about that. No. <laughs> stay listening, stay listening. There's still a, a, a good amount of meat on the bone uh to, to to nourish you but but again you, you get to noah and again noah was perfect in his generations uh, no the seed promise was preserved through uh uh through god uh preserving noah and his family on the on the ark and he just destroyed the rest of uh of of humanity now you have uh them come out of the ark and the seed promise is, is, is still alive. And so the next step is Japheth. Oh, not Japheth, Shem. Shem is the next step of the seed promise. So you have Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Mm -hmm. And Shem is the next step. He's the one that's chosen. And we, we, we read elements of this in the wake of the ark. And he continues, this is where, Shem is where we get the term Semitic from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer because usually when we talk about Semitic, we're talking about just the Jewish people. But if we're being really... It's, it's an allusion to the seed promise. That you're yeah, it is. It's Shem. And, and so... Uh, and, and Shem is, is, is actually wider in scope than just the Jews uh, because all the Semitic people come from, from Shem uh, if we're being really s specific in the, the way the, the term is used. But... As we look at, the, again, the continued genealogy, so there's a continued genealogy. Why, why does it matter? What does it matter that Shem, where, where, where the line of Shem leads to? Well, it, it stretches back to Genesis 3.15. The next link in the seed promise is a huge one, and that is Abraham. So as we read in chapters 10 and 11 of Genesis, which brings us to chapter 12, we have genealogy and elements that lead us to Abraham. And Abraham's significance cannot be really overstated. It is so significant because out of the sea of humanity, now God chooses Abraham. And it's through Abraham that he, uh, he makes continued promises. Now, this isn't 
a shift or a change in his plan. It is an advancement of his plan. And when he speaks to Abraham, he speaks to Abraham regarding his Zerah, so uh, his seed. Uh, his, Abraham's, Abraham and his seed are going to be blessed. They're going to be blessed with the land of, of Canaan, um, which they're not going to inherit yet. Uh, we read of that in, in Genesis as well as in Hebrews, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by the way, when we look at that, when we refer to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, do you know what we're referring to? We're referring to the seed promise. Because Abraham is chosen, and his, then his seed is, is promised to be the heir of all of these promises. Now, who is the next uh, seed? We have Abraham, and it's Isaac, not Ishmael. And then from Isaac, Isaac has twins. And who's the next link in the seed promise? Is it Esau or is it Jacob? And ultimately it's Jacob whose name then becomes Israel. Israel uh, is, um, or Jacob, Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, has 12 sons. And at the end of Genesis, there is promises given, and ultimately the son that is going to continue this promise of, of messianic lineage is Judah. And so you look at the book of Genesis itself, uh, the genealogies that we find in Genesis all speak of this lineage of the seed promise. Now, you start with, it, uh, with Genesis 3.15, and Genesis 3.15 uh, is our first parents, and Eve is ultimately going to give birth to a, an heir, and that heir is Seth. And we, we see all of these genealogies made throughout the uh, book of Genesis, which, which lead us, and, and, and we're, we're, we end with Judah being the one that has messianic elements to it, that uh, it's going to, the, the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. And to him will be the obedience of the people. So Genesis is a book all about the seed promise. And that same promise that was given to Abraham, that uh, in him and in his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They will inherit the land. Uh, all of these things are outworkings of what we find in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, it is, it's, an, it's a continued advancement. So... Uh, Historically, then, we find the seed promise go quiet for a while. It's not that there, the seed war isn't happening, because when we begin in Exodus, there is a uh, what, what is often called the first pogrom of the Israelites. And I want to be careful here because it's very interesting. We, we often use the, we might say, the first pogrom of the Jewish people. Um, well, that's a little bit anachronistic because at this time there were Hebrews or Israelites. Yes, there was the tribe of Judah within them, but uh, the, the entity known as the Jewish people wouldn't become kind of known as uh, a specific entity until after the split of the kingdom in 930 BC, which you had Judah to the south and, and Israel to the north. But nevertheless, the first pogrom of the Israelites to try to destroy the, the, this nation of, of, uh, of the Israelites is found in, in Exodus chapter 1. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to look at what was attempted. The Pharaoh that did not remember or know Joseph uh, after many generations, that, gener that generation died. And, but Israel grew to a, a, a large and mighty people within the uh, realm of, of Egypt, you find that the, uh, the Pharaoh that did not remember Joseph began persecuting uh, the people of Israel. And it, it advances in stages until you get to the point where they want to kill what? Every male child. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So every, it, it's, it's uh, let the daughters live, but we're going to kill every male child that comes forth from this people. 
And I think, again, from a big picture perspective, that is the, the, the seed war, the serpent looking to destroy the male children. And this continues as the, like I said, the seed promise, as far as it's specifically the, the, the genealogy goes quiet during the, the rest of the Torah, uh, for the most part, because uh, another tribe really becomes uh, front and center, and that's the tribe of Levi because of the giving of the law. But um, right when they enter into the promised land, it's uh, it's interesting that the seed promise in a in a, in kind of a, a radical way takes center stage again. Now, like I said, there is the singular lineage, this ancestry that is running through um, history. Now, ultimately, as we approach the New Testament, we know from the testimony of the New Covenant writings that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of this seed promise. Uh, this genealogy, what I, what I often talk about in my classes is, is imagine there being a dragnet uh, a, a figurative dragnet that all of the promises and inheritance that is given to this seed, this ancestry, after it is, uh, after the heir dies, or it's or the blessing or the heir, or the inheritance is passed on, it drags to the next one. So, one that is going to crush the serpent has serpent said one that's going to bless all the nations one that is going to be the heir of the land uh and ultimately it's, this is drawing us historically then towards david because david's the next big link in the seed promise mm -hmm. uh but the bridge between the exodus and the monarchy um, when when you find some ge the elements of genealogy, one, like I said, it's surprise. It's really surprising because this prostitute from Jericho, Rahab, uh, she, she becomes legendary because of her faith in the Lord and and uh, helping the spies. But her, her the big contribution <laughs> that she actually has, the biggest I should say, the biggest contribution she has to salvation history is that she marries a man from the tribe of Judah and Rahab becomes part of this advancing of the seed promise. So Rahab and Salmon, they produce and, and, and there's another big surprise that comes a couple generations later and that is Ruth. Ruth marries Boaz. So you have a Canaanite woman and a Moabite woman that God chooses to marry, and I, uh, the book of Matthew stresses these things in in chapter one. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a moment, but we want to stop and, and demonstrate David mm -hmm. as the next kind of um, portion of the advancement of the seed promise. So uh, you know. Ruth is is a is an amazing story, but it's you know a lot of people gravitate towards the romance or the the elements therein of of these two people coming together. But when you get to the end of Ruth, we see the main purpose of the book of Ruth was to show the genealogy that leads us to David. So the seed promise continues that began with Eve, goes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah, and now it brings us to David. And David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is given a covenant, and God makes a covenant with David, very similar to what he did with Abraham. And the covenant has to do with David's Zerah. Once again, we have that seed promise. And this has to do with kingship and the, uh, the, the living of Israel as a nation and peace in the land. And that's going to come through the son of David. And this, of course, is where we get uh, really heightened and specific messianic terminology and, and expectation. The son of David. And so we see the prophet speak of this son of David that's coming. So, again, all of these things have a singular purpose and a singular source in this seed promise stretching back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. 
So advancing through the seed promise, the last link that we kind of have, again, the last real big link that we have in the Old Testament to this seed promise is Zerubbabel. Uh, Zerubbabel is uh, a man that comes back from the exile and is governor in Judah. And his name is fascinating because, first off, he's, he's really the last big name in the seed promise that we find in the Old Testament. But his name, if you can kind of hear the word Zerah there, Zerubbabel. Mm-hmm. And his name means seed from Babylon. So uh, there's all sorts of interesting elements that we don't have time to get into in regards to this, but there's a curse with Jeconiah and uh, uh, ultimately this question of is the Davidic dynasty going to last? If you you know anything about the promises of God, we know it's going to. And Zerubbabel turns out to be that key that maintains the the seed promise of, uh, it's, it's life. Of course, we know it can't fail because God has promised it. Mm-hmm. But then we get uh, uh, the, the, the during the silent years, and we finally get to the arrival of the sea, the singular one, the he that is going to crush the serpent's head, the offspring of Abraham that is going to be the, the, the true singular one, the singular son of David that is going to be the Messiah. And how does the New Testament start? So let, let's read it. Let's read, yeah. let's read Matthew 1, verse 1. The genealogy of Jesus Christ. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Yeah. First one. This first one. So it, the way we read our, our, our Bibles, most of us, I guess, we turn from Malachi to Matthew, and the first thing we see is a genealogy, and it's stressed that he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. This is the seed promise. The reason why both Matthew and Luke have genealogies is to note the fulfillment of the seed promise. And so you have, in in Matthew, you have Abraham and David being the ones that are stressed. In Luke, you have it going all the way back to Adam. Adam. Right. And so uh, fascinating to see. We, um, maybe that's fodder for a future uh, episode. Is the, looking the at differences the, between those the, two the genealogies. genealogies. Yeah, it's a, a a fascinating journey. Which ultimately that might not be that satisfying because I don't have the ultimate answer, but I do know uh, in, kind of the ins and outs of the differences, and I do have some grasp of why there are differences. But as far as do you have a quick like maybe a few minute take on that to offer or is yeah, best saved for no i i can i can give you my opinion okay. um first what we can know okay uh matthew's purpose is to declare jesus as the son of abraham and the son of david mm-hmm. and that is he's the one that blesses the nations and the and the one that is the davidic king the one that has all authority as the king and we really see that in the bookends of matthew in Matthew, we, we see it beginning with the son of David, the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham is going to bless all the nations. And that's what is declared. In you and your seed, I will bless the nations. And uh, at the end of the book of Matthew, you have Jesus give the Great Commission. And he says, behold, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. That's the Messiah, the son of David. Yep. And he says, go therefore and make disciples of what? Of all the nations. So he is the fulfillment of the promises given to, to, da- to David and to Abraham. Luke is fascinating because Luke doesn't begin his gospel with the genealogy. It's wedged in chapter 3, right after the baptism of Jesus, when it's declared, you are my son. And rather than having an ascending genealogy that takes us from the... Um, uh, the, the beginning the, from from Abraham, it, it descends. It goes backwards. Right. So, the purpose that um, Luke is developing is to show that Jesus is the Son of God, the one that is going to destroy the works of the devil, and he takes us back to the garden where Adam failed. That that's it descends back to Adam, the Son of God, and we're taken back to the garden where Adam failed, and. So, 
it's after the baptism and before the temptation in the wilderness that you have this genealogy. So he takes us back all the way to the to the garden to contrast Adam with Jesus. Because Jesus then goes forth and is tempted by the serpent. And where Adam disobeyed, Jesus obeyed. That's why that's there. And I'm very confident that's why that's there. Mm-hmm. The bigger question, I shouldn't say the bigger question. Well, I like how you juxtapose this because I, you know, I often, unless I'm sitting there reading myself, it's easy to lose track, for me at least, of where these different stories come together within a book. Like, right. You know, um, I would have to go back and look to see, oh, the genealogy is followed by the temptations. I didn't remember that. But I like the emphasis on context. Because that's all. There's always something you can glean from expanding the context a little bit. Yeah, and I, you know, I remember when I was first reading the Bible, and I thought it was weird that a, a genealogy is wedged right here, mm-hmm. right in between the baptism and the temptation. Why yeah. is there a genealogy there? Well, well and it's, it's good to keep in mind that the the chapter and verse demarcations didn't come along until much, much later. Right. So as Luke was writing this, he didn't. It wasn't say this is chapter one of my letter, and this here's chapter, chapter four. That is new new topic, right? Right. And so, uh, yeah, it's there for a reason, and uh, there's themes. That's one thing to remember about the Gospels. The Gospels each have themes, and mm-hmm. Luke has, even though he's drawing from a lot of the same source material, historical source material. Uh, it's uh, well, Luke was a, a physician, yeah, and so. I sometimes see the him going back to Adam as you know kind of what you're saying, but also just to emphasize that he's he's a man. Jesus is a he's a son of God, but he is a man, right? The, emphasizing his, his humanity. humanity, sure. And and going back to and again, he's but but he's the ultimate man. He's the right. man that succeeds. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the he in in a sense of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 he's the one that actually is going to crush the serpent's head so reminding us taking us back to the garden uh is is a way to again it's subtle but it's brilliant uh you know so uh the other thing in regards and this is something that we really don't have time to get into but uh, the question about the differences um in in uh the names of uh, Luke's and Matthew's genealogies, and the, yeah, he follows two different branches in the right and the and tree, and that's the historical suggestion. I, I should say it's really pretty modern, but it, it goes back. There there are evidences that goes back to I think the early church that suggested this was that it was Luke's was Mary's genealogy, and. Um, Matthew's is is Joseph's. Uh, the problem with that I have with that is that's not what the text says. That's where I was going to go. I I've heard that many times, but when I just put that aside and read it, yeah, I don't see it. No, it, it just says this is you know it, he was the son of as was supposed the son of Joseph who was the son of, mm-hmm. and then it continues uh, and then it, it takes us all the way back. So. Uh, that will be well. Some, that's where we get trouble from our unbelieving neighbors. Is they'll, they'll they like to go to these differences and point it as as contradictions because they both do appear to go through Joseph, but they're so I'm just looking at uh, Luke three twenty three. Jesus, when he began his ministry, he was about thirty years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of. Heli. Yeah, so again, we have son of Joseph, son of Heli. It, we, it would be a cinch if it says Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was the daughter of so-and-so, right. who was the son of, but that's not what it says. Right. It says, it, it, it's tracing it through Joseph. So I do think, again, both genealogies are correct in what they're trying to demonstrate. Uh, there, The difference is... Go ahead. Sorry, as you were talking, I just kept looking. I went back to Matthew chapter 1, and we got verse 16. We're getting to the end of the genealogy at this point. It says, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, husband of Mary. So right. there again, this is why, like I said, I've heard this Mary versus Joseph genealogy, but that's the plain reading of the text. The plain reading of the text doesn't, doesn't 
But then that brings the question, and we're getting a little sidetracked, I hope. But it's still part of the seed promise sure. element. Uh, so Matthew says that the father of Joseph was Jacob, whereas Luke says it's Heli. Right. So, which is right. And here, here are here's some of the... Um, the suggestions for it outside of the Mary thing, which again, I, I, I don't see, you know, playing read the text, it, it, they're tracing it through jo- Joseph. First off, we know these are selective genealogies. So mm-hmm. a son of doesn't necessarily mean an, an immediate like father, son, father, son, father, father right. son relationship. Uh, so, there's there's that to, well we see that elsewhere in the gospels when G- jesus himself is referred to as the son of david right of course he's not the immediate one so there there's there's that dynamic the other dynamic is is something that uh, i have a hunch in regards to why there's a, a difference and it does have to do with this jeconiah curse okay that i referenced and um it's too long to get in, so <laughs> okay. let's just, let's let's just say that, that this could be good fodder for a, a, a future discussion. Okay. Uh, as um, it, what's interesting is he, here's the key to to understanding the Jeconiah curse. The Jeconiah curse is that no son of Jeconiah was going to be ruling and reigning on the throne, and it's at the point of Jeconiah in Luke's genealogy where there is a diversion, but both Matthew and um, Luke. Luke go th- note Zerubbabel. So something happens in that there, there, there seems to be some sort of diversion at that point, which takes us from rather from the kingly lineage that we find in Matthew through a different lineage that still brings us back to David, but through his son Nathan. And so there my theory is Luke is tracing uh, a a genealogy that bypasses the Jeconiah curse. Uh, and it might have to do with a Levite marriage or something like that where um there's an inheritance but there's a physical uh where does Zerubbabel show up on the scenes of history? He's in well, well right around 538. Okay. BC is the return of the exiles. Right, right. So 538 BC is. I mean, Zerubbabel's already grown at that point, but he is. Um, you know, he's he's the return of the yeah return of the exile. The book mm-hmm. of Ezra, the beginning of the book of Ezra. That's where we find Zerubbabel. Mm-hmm. So interesting things to to, and they're related to what we're talking about. Yeah, the sea promise. So, uh, anyways, we're at the, uh, you know, the, the gospel accounts. So, Jesus is the fulfillment of the seed promise. And that, that is what we, uh, again, look at. There are outworkings in regards to the seed promise in, in regards to the many that we, we would say uh, Israel as a nation is related in part of the seed promise because they are the many. Uh, the seed of Abraham, the, the the ethnic nation that comes from Abraham that God said he would make a mighty nation of. But we also have the spiritual offspring of Abraham, which is most important. And that's really was the debate that, that Jesus had in John chapter 8, was, uh, yes, I know you're Abraham's children, but you seek to kill me. You're of your father, the devil. So, we need to have faith like Abraham had. And let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, and we'll see how we, whether we're Jew or Gentile, how we are related to this seed promise. So in Galatians chapter 3, really the context here, Paul is stressing who is an who is the heir of the who are the heirs of the promises given to Abraham and how do you receive this inheritance of the promises given to Abraham which are which is salvation which mm-hmm. is being blessed by the sovereign lord and being heirs of the land uh which is the which is the uh the the, the place of 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 heaven uh, which will be inherited by Abraham and his offspring. So 
In chapter 3, first off, those who truly are the sons of Abraham, we we see in verse 7 of chapter 3, Paul says, know that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So who are truly the sons of Abraham? Well, first off, Individually, the son of Abraham is Jesus. And that's what we saw in in Matthew chapter 1. So he is the seed of Abraham. And uh, later on in chapter 3, Paul says in verse 16, he says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and your offspring who is Christ. So Paul notes that the one, Paul isn't saying that there isn't a many dynamic to the offspring of Abraham, because we're actually going to see that later on in the text. And furthermore, we would we would understand that even within uh, the Genesis text, when in chapter 15, when God takes Abraham out of the tent and says, look at the sky, look at the stars, so will your seed be. There wasn't just one star in the sky. It was saying that th- th- there were many are going to come. But the ultimate aspect of this and paul is stressing the grammar here showing that he didn't say to offsprings it was offspring it was singular collective singular depending on context who is christ so christ is the seed the the ultimate heir of the seed promise now go down to verse 28 and 29 this is one of the most important passages in the bible because it shows how whether you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter where you're from or what has come about. If you're in Christ, if you're in the seed of Abraham, in the seed of the woman, in the seed of David, that's Jesus, you are an heir. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So there we have it. I mean, it's it's plain as day right there. It it the, Jesus is the seed, and if we're going to be counted as Abraham's offspring in the many sense, in the in the a sense of being an heir of the promise of blessing, of inheriting the land, that is Christ's. Um, purpose is in and and this is the radical thing here in in galatians uh is that gentiles through faith in christ jesus become heirs of the promises given to abraham this was a scandal in the first century because there was always a thought that and proclamations in the old testament and a thought in in regards to the rabbinical budding of judaism was that, well, Gentiles are going to be a part of the kingdom to come, but they're not heirs. They're not heirs of the promises given to Abraham. They're going to be perhaps part of this in some tangential manner, Mm -hmm. but not heirs. And here we have full standing citizens and heirs of of, of the coming kingdom that is being given to... Uh, Gentiles, and it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, so that speaks nationality is not an issue, economic status isn't an issue, and whether you're male or female is not an issue. If you are a believer in Christ, if you're in Christ, then you are Abraham's and the seed. And it, it, it's sperma here, which uh, is the Greek form of zera, and uh, your heirs according to the promise. So um, this is uh, one of the most important texts in regards to the seed promise. Galatians chapter 3. This really is one that explains the Bible the, the, and, and shows how we're part of history. We who believe in Christ, who confess him as Lord and have the power of the holy spirit dwelling in us we are fulfillments of biblical prophecy we are those that are uh, we're blessed among the nations 
And we have faith like Abraham. Abraham heard the words of Christ and believed. We hear the words of Christ and believes. And even though we may not be physically descended from Abraham, we are in Christ, who is the heir, who was physically descended from Abraham. And furthermore, we have all the spiritual benefits of Christ through faith. And that's what Galatians 3 is all about. It's, it's not nationality that matters. It's faith that matters. Jew or Gentile, if you are in Christ, if you have, uh, if you are chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, if you are uh, placed in Him, if you you know again uh, repented of your sins and believe in Him, these are things that demonstrate us as being heirs of the promises given to Abraham. And this connects us to the whole Bible. It yeah. shows how what God was doing and promising and doing through Abraham isn't disconnected from us. It's very much related to who we are right now in Christ. So uh, the next portion that we can explore in regards to this, and we kind of get from, a, a, again, a thumbnail sketch from Genesis to Revelation, is, is in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and 13, in particular chapter 12, though, is about this seed war and having this under, uh, understanding in the backdrop helps us understand how the seed war has progressed throughout history and how it still is going on um now i'm a futurist in regards to the book of revelation so i don't think uh at least from chap uh, from chapter 12 verse 6 on I don't think these things have happened yet, uh, but we'll um, we'll address that as we go. Now, let's read the first part of chapter 12, and we can see how this is related to the seed promise. Do you want to go ahead and read? Start, just write at one? Re read uh, one through five. Okay. 12, Revelation 12, 1, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, in the agony, agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, the great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, who, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Okay, so interesting to note the language used here. Now, in the flow of Revelation from chapter, the, the end of chapter 11, we have the the the, the, the trumpet, the seventh trumpet sounding. And this is the kingdom of God has become the kingdom of, or the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. And so there is a transfer of power here. And what I think chapters 12 through 14 is an interlude that speaks of this great seed war. And one through five is a recap. You have the woman, first you have the language woman, which is interesting to use. Mm -hmm. Woman, and that imagery stretches us back to Genesis 3.15. But she's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet on her head a crown of 12 stars. So th this is an allusion back to Joseph's dream in regards to Israel and the 12 sons. So woman as well as the uh, it's as well as the sun and, and moon and 12 stars speaks of the seed promise I think stretching us again the language stretching us back to Genesis 3:15 but it advancing to the point of Israel being the carrier of this promise so the nation of Israel really was the one that uh, ultimately gave birth to the son that was what was promised and so you have this seed war going on and uh notice here the dragon who is the serpent well we read that later in chapter 12 wants to devour the child this stretches back to 
Genesis 3, verse 15. There is a mm-hmm. son coming. And interestingly, in, in verse 5, um, the ESV here doesn't, uh, there, there's actually a double stressing here that the ESV decided to forego. But it says, uh, the, the Greek more literally is, she gave birth to a son, a male child, one who is to rule the nations. Now, I, I, I actually like having the double stressing in there because, uh, of, of course, a son is a male child. You know, a male child is a son. But a male child, the reason why that, I think, is doubly stressed when you have the male child stressed is it's, a, it's an allusion back to Genesis 3.15. What was the one clue? we had who was going to crush the serpent's head it's a singular male a male child was going to crush a he so uh then we see that again the the serpent is looking to devour but uh the child was caught up to god and to his throne so he is the one who is to rule the the uh the nations with a rod of iron and so ultimately he fails in uh, devouring the, uh, the male child. And then we, we get to verse 6. And verse 6 is something that uh, the woman, it's, we see the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. So here we get into, based on the context and the language of 1260 days, we get into the happenings of this time period of Daniel, the last half of Daniel's 70th week. So we see that um, this woman flees into the wilderness, and we've, we've, we read on in chapter 12 that the serpent wants to destroy the woman. Again, this is that seed war enmity between the woman and the serpent and between his seed and her seed now the the serpent or the dragon ultimately can't get to the the woman here she's she's preserved and interestingly then we get to the end of chapter 12 and verse 17 and if you want to read verse 17 we see the seed promise brought up we, we have the seed promise and the seed war stressed here in language but now it really uh, unfolds and is is explicit when we get to chapter 12 verse 17 then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of god and hold to the testimony of jesus and he stood on the sand of the sea so we have the word seed here the rest of her seed so all three expressions of the seed promise are i think are seen here you have the one the male child who is christ mm-hmm. and uh he the serpent can't get to him he fails he's caught up to god he's ruling he's the one that's going to rule the nations then you have the woman here who uh based on the language speaks of the ethnic offspring of abraham isaac and jacob based on the language at the beginning and there is a remnant here, and again, I think this has to do with the uh, the happenings at the midpoint of the 70th week where there's a, a group that flees out of Jerusalem that the serpent can't ultimately destroy. And um, because he's not able to do that, we see he's, made fu- he's furious and goes off to make war with the rest of her offspring. And the, the description is those who uh, hold to the testimony of Jesus and com- keep the commands of God. This would be... The, the church. Uh, and again, we are, the rest of our offspring would be connected, even though it's a different author, connected to the concepts that we found in Galatians chapter 3. Those who keep the testimony of Jesus. And, and, and then we have verse chapter 13, which is about how he goes to war against those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So, uh, this seed promise dynamic, we see the seed promise continuing. Ultimately, who, who is the one that conquers? Christ conquers, and he ultimately is going to raise his people. He ultimately is going to redeem Israel. And so this seed promise is something that has its fulfillment already in the coming of Christ. It has its fulfillment already in the uh, existence of Israel, the existence of the church, 
And it's going to have its ultimate fulfillment as well when the Lord raises his people, when we rule with him, and when he purifies Israel as a nation, and they are made clean. And that's the things that we find in the book of Revelation. The, the serpent will not win. The serpent can't win. Uh, all of these things that Christ, that God brings about through bringing Christ and Christ purifying Israel and his, and his people, the church, these things come about because the serpent cannot win. Christ is the one that crushes the serpent's head. And just as a, to kind of see how this ties the whole Bible together in, in Revelation 22, the last mention of the seed promise is in the last chapter of the Bible. When uh, Jesus says in verse 16, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about the things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And the, the word there for descendant is offspring. So the seed promise is referenced by Jesus here in the very last chapter of the Bible. I am the descendant of David. And then, again, that goes back to the promises that were given to the seed of David, which Jesus fulfills. Uh, he is the Messiah. So that is a a short journey through the seed promise. I don't know how long that took us. I got an hour and four minutes just coming up on oh, since I bad. hit record. So so about an hour. So that, yeah, that, that works. That incredible timing on that. Oh, I just discovered my uh, iPad Bible has a chat has a has a book after Revelation. Just the the tables of weight and measures. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, the 67th yeah. book. Yeah, a bath. Like a bath is about six gallons or 22 liters. <laughs> Sorry, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's an aside. It's got a bath, a becca, a core, a cubit, a denarius. It, uh, all these well, things those things are, are, are actually good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, not part of the seed promise. Not part of the seed <laughs> promise. No. Well, thank you. Um, that was interesting. <laughs> Great good. topic. Yeah, I'm, I, and, and again, I hope those that listen if this is something new what what's what's fascinating is is this is just a a cursory yeah, 20,000 feet over looking over Genesis mm -hmm. to Revelation there's all sorts of minutia further minutia that as you go through the curse the of Jeconiah yeah that type of stuff yeah. is 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 all, is is all throughout the bible and so there really isn't a, a book or a chapter that isn't probably in some way related to the sea promise and what God has uh, planned and promised and bringing about. Yeah. So. Well, I always appreciate that. I mean, you can sit down and, and read your Bible, you know, pick up, read a couple chapters in a day and, and read verse by verse, you know, as uh, most Christians will sit down and do, but you don't pick up on those things. You know, when you're in Galatians, it might've been months since you read Genesis. Right. And having that, having that big picture is, is, is a way to, uh, really, at times, further understand the, the smaller picture. The, the, the more minutia is, is is tied to the big picture, and you can really see and make sense of the minutia in understanding the big picture. You need both. Yeah. Both feed off of one another. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well. Well. Thank you. Yeah, it was great to be with you and and, and discuss these things. So yeah. Thanks we'll, for. We'll see about the curse of Jeconiah and yeah. whether or not that is uh, on the agenda for. I, I'm going to put that on my list as a, a, a I, that would be a fun topic. And that's yeah. found in in uh, Jeremiah chapter twenty nine, I believe. Uh, let me let me confirm that. But yeah, it's 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 in it's in Jeremiah. Because that is the the text, and it, it really is is shortly before the I'm getting there. Shortly before the declaration of the the no, oh, I bet you it's back in twenty three, twenty two, Jeremiah twenty two. Yep, Jeremiah 22 is uh, where we have the message to uh, Jeconiah. And what's interesting is you have that, and then in, verse, in chapter 23, you have the declaration of the righteous branch. That was the thing right after that. So mm -hmm. God's cutting off something, but he's also saying there's a righteous branch that is, that is going to come. And uh, all of those things would be, are, are things that you want to pay attention to when looking at this curse of Jeconiah. Cool.
Well, I had more I, I thought it would be fun to talk about, but um, given time and kind of the nature of some of what I was going to say, I think we'll take that offline. And it's cool. Um, yeah, so I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for coming back and giving me a chance to kind of revive after three months of uh, not posting an episode. So, All right. Thanks, Andy. I enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs> Echo Zoe Radio is an outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries. If you are blessed by the show, please consider offering your support. There are many things you can do to help, including prayer, sharing the show with others, and your financial support. Echo Zoe Ministries is a registered nonprofit organization with 501c3 tax exempt status, and your donations are tax deductible. For more information about how you can support Echo Zoe Ministries, please visit echozoe.com support. That wraps up episode 192. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. For show notes, visit echozoe.com slash 192. Please also check out the Christian podcast community. There's an ever-growing list of fantastic shows focusing on all sorts of topics, and you'll find them at christianpodcastcommunity.org. Before I close, I want to talk a little bit about the future of Echo Zoe Radio. I've been doing the podcast since May of 2008, over 16 years. And I've genuinely enjoyed every episode. That said, it's becoming increasingly difficult to continue the show in its current format. New guests are much more difficult to get than they were in the early days. And I'm not sure I want to keep cycling through the same list of guests that I've been doing shows with for the last few years. Podcasting is very different than it was in 2008, 2009, 2010. In many ways, for the better. It's easy to do. And there are a lot of great people doing it. I set out to build a library of great material addressing important issues that my kids could someday reference to answer their questions. I've also sought to make the glory of God a foundational motivator. The library has become respectable over the years and all to God's glory. This isn't to say that Echo Zoe Radio is coming to an end, though it's not to say that it isn't either. I've reached an inflection point, and honestly, I don't know where to go from here. I do very much enjoy producing the show. I just don't know where else to take it. Seeking out a new guest and topic every month takes more than I can give. It seems that in order to continue, the format will need to change, but I don't know how. There's much to say about glorifying God in Echo Zoe Ministries and in Echo Zoe Radio. For one, while stats have always been interesting, they've never been a driver. I've never been preoccupied with unique downloads or social media reposts. I want God to be glorified, and preoccupation with those things seems as though though it would be to seek a piece of that glory, a piece that isn't mine. For that matter, being the face or the voice of a ministry, this ministry, or any ministry, isn't important either. There are so many other podcasters out there doing a fantastic job and producing wonderful, God-glorifying shows. While I love it too, I don't really need it. I get enjoyment out of being a part of serving God in some way, whether or not I'm the face of it. For example, I spent 10 years recording and producing video of the sermons at Gospel of Grace Fellowship. I was never asked to do it. I just took on it, took it on, and I did it. I did it because it helped my church. I did it because it helped God's church. I did it because I enjoyed it. Going forward, I'm going to continue to pray about what to do with Equizoi Ministries. Perhaps the podcast will continue as it has. Perhaps it will change a little, or maybe I'll pursue other means of serving him to his glory. Until I get it figured out, though, I think it only prudent to adjust the frequency of the show. Echo Zoe Radio will be periodical. It won't necessarily be a monthly show anymore, though it won't likely be more frequent than monthly either. This episode was recorded on July 28th, 2024, as the August episode. There may or may not be a September episode or an October episode. But Lord willing, we'll be back soon with another episode of Echo Zoe Radio. Thank you.